Uh, and then actually the first thing I will would like to uh, do is just ask whether there are any uh, burning questions uh, from previous lessons, because today we're going to go into the six vowel theory. Uh, and I don't know, it's going to be a little bit of a roller coaster. So, uh, you know, if there's anything, so I want to kind of make sure that we have a clean sort of workspace. So if there's any lingering questions from the last uh, two times, uh, then uh, now is your opportunity to stick your hand up. I think we need to uh, distinguish very sharply here between Middle Chinese and Old Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, so, some people would feel like uh, what I'm about to say is an overstatement, but I would say the differences between Carl Grin's Middle Chinese and the Middle Chineses that various people work with today are pretty superficial. So um, like, uh, let's say, uh, Li Fang Kui's Middle Chinese is a kind of orthographically cleaned up version of Carl Grin's because Carl Grin was, was kind of not a big believer in the phoneme. So he tried to uh, capture what he regarded as real uh, uh, phonetic uh, differences uh, which means that his reconstructions are kind of very ornate orthographically. So Li Feng Kui came along and just tidied those up and removed all distinctions that were not needed from a kind of information theoretical perspective. Uh, and um, I think that Baxter's Middle Chinese is in effect exactly the same as uh, uh, Li Feng Kui's. Uh, although actually there might be an issue about the Chongyu distinction that, that someone you know, can tell me about, which is that I think that Baxter would claim that his system contains slightly more information than, um, than, um, the, than uh, Li Feng Kui's or, or Carl Grun's. But in any case, just to, to kind of return to your question, there's a clear continuity there. And you know, from my perspective, not a lot more progress has been made. Uh, whereas in the case of old Chinese, I think it can be safely said that Carl Grin's old Chinese, uh, he kind of posed all the right questions and came up with answers that are almost all considered uh, superseded now. What is true, especially if you read Baxter's 1992 book, is he always starts from Carl Grin. And for me, uh, this was a huge obstacle as a reader because because then I need to sort of first understand Carl Grin's system and then kind of fix all of the problems that have been seen in it uh, over, you know, 60 years. Yeah. But that's, let's say, which is to say, from a, from a pedagogical perspective, Carl Grin still has a huge role in, um, in presenting the current understanding of old Chinese phonology, it kind of in a way that I was, I was dealing here with Don, Duan Yutsai, which is like, well, we start from this person's view and then we fix the problems with it. So I am trying very hard uh, kind of in, in, in my presentation to kind of write Carl Grin out of history in a, in a sense, by way of finding a faster presentation that goes directly from what is the evidence to what is the current thinking. Uh, but uh, um, if you read Baxter's 1992 book, you know, he will always say, we start with Carl Grin, we go through Li Feng Kui, and now these are my proposals. So, um, so I would say that um, uh, kind of to, to, sum, to sum up what I have been saying, Carl Grin's uh, mode of thinking and his, his identification of problems are still the modes of thinking and the identification of problems we live with, but his particular solutions for all Chinese have been basically superseded. Uh, uh, the difference between the type A and type B syllables is, is one of the most controversial areas in Chinese historical phonology. Uh, and the, um, let's say the two, two, here are two of the most common current perspectives. Uh, Zhang Zheng Shangfeng, thinks that, uh, I hope I get this right, that type A syllables had long vowels, 
and type B syllables had short vowels. Whereas uh, um, uh, Baxter and Cigar think that type A syllables had pharyngealized initials and type B syllables did not. So the main, um, the main phonetic evidence of what the type AB distinction is, is that type B syllables systematically palatalized in, uh, let's say, in the early Han Dynasty. So there's, there's some kind of, you know, which, so which is to say, type A had a non-palatalizing phonetic uh, conditioning environment, and type B had a palatalizing phonetically conditioned environment. So in 1992, Baxter uh, actually projected a medial ya all the way back to Old Chinese and said like, well, ya is a, is, is a palatalizing conditioning environment. But there's, there's um, when you look at like early Sanskrit uh, or, or early Chinese attempts to write Indic languages, actually Gandhari more than Sanskrit, uh, there's no evidence that there was this medial ya there's no comparative evidence that there was this medial ya. So, uh, so, so he's dropped this medial ya idea, and instead uh, Baxter and Cigar picked up this idea that originally came from Jerry Norman that um, that uh, f that the f the the type A syllables were pharyngealized and the type B syllables were non-pharyngealized. And then you know you may well ask, well, why you know would would non-pharyngealization condition palatalization. And this is where you should really ask a phonetician, but uh, there is some pretty good evidence from Arabic dialectology that it, it does, it, it's, it, that it's reasonable. And um, actually, uh, it was, uh, one of the students, I sent a, a link to this uh, in email correspondence, but um, Mark Miyaki, uh, four years ago at SOAS, gave a, a talk on, you know, his own reflections about the type A, type B, uh, syllable that you can find on YouTube, uh, and and he does some very interesting comparisons with um, with um, uh, Arabic dialects. So uh, so the answer is ultimately we we don't know. I actually think what is the origin of the type A type B distinction is one of the great um, is kind of one of the one of the you know, if, if you if you could tell us the answer in a really convincing, definitive way, then you'd be famous. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So now we're going to be talking today about the six vowel theory, and um, yeah. So a few sort of preliminary remarks, which is that uh, three investigators, uh, Zhang Zhen Shangfang. Uh, Sergei Starostin and Bill Baxter all independently came up with the six vowel theory uh, around the same time, uh, I mean, kind of, let's say roughly around the same time, between the late 60s and the early 80s. Uh, and uh, kind of word has it that Zhang Zhen Shangfeng was the uh, earliest and that he came up with it uh, while sort of after he was sent down in the Cultural Revolution and he was out in the countryside with a lot of you know time to to think about Chinese historical phonology just in his by himself and then he kind of saw this theory uh, and, and then uh, probably second was uh, Sergei Starostin and then third was Baxter uh, but uh, the 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 you know the the, the work of Starostin and uh, uh, and Zhang Shangfeng was not really available to Baxter, so uh, they were all sort of working independently, but starting from some ideas of uh, pulley blanks and um, and uh, yachontovs. So why am I saying all this? It's because in some sense, if three people at the same time came independently came up with the same theory, the theory must be kind of obvious. Right. It must be that, like, if you have the right background and you just sit and think for a while, uh, the six vowel theory is kind of obvious. But it's still uh, controversial. Uh, so, so the people at uh, in Beijing don't really uh, like it, and the people in Taipei they don't like it either. 
so it's not so obvious that once it's pointed out, uh, any well-informed person would agree. And let's say I haven't found it particularly obvious. So one project that I made in my book that now I'm making a sort of second effort at here is how to make the six vowel theory more obvious. And uh, you know, uh, you'll know, you see what, what you think of my presentation. Uh, and then maybe yourselves, as you think about these things, you can think about what kind of presentation of data or what sort of posing of the question would make it even clearer. Because I, I firmly believe there is some way that, that uh, we can make the six vowel theory just really uh, obvious. Okay, so uh, here we go. So first I'm going to look at uh, type A syllables. And, uh, and first, you know, within that, uh, the internal reconstruction of middle Chinese syllables that end with a velar nasal. Then we'll look at the internal reconstruction of middle Chinese syllables that end with dentals. Uh, and we'll already get the ideas, we'll already get a sort of six vowel theory, or, or actually we'll start with a sort of five vowel theory, uh, motivated by the first uh, situation, which is uh, the internal reconstruction of middle Chinese syllables ending with ng. Uh, and then we will sort of test that theory against different uh, other situations and then see that it either works or has to be refined a little bit. So then we'll turn to the type B syllables, which are more complicated, and then kind of repeat the, the process. So internal reconstruction of middle Chinese syllables ending with ng, and internal reconstruction of middle Chinese syllables ending with dentals. Uh, and just a, a notational convention where in Baxter's middle Chinese uh, transcription, he writes O, uh, I am going to use a schwa, and that's just because I think it simplifies the presentation, because uh, otherwise you get O meaning one thing in Old Chinese and a different thing in Middle Chinese, and it can just be, I think, a little bit visually confusing. So uh, I've made this uh, sort of orthographic substitution in order to uh, assist with the clarity of the um, presentation. Okay, so internal reconstruction of Middle Chinese type A syllables ending with uh, ng. So we'll look at the distribution of uh, these syllables and then propose the reconstruction of labial velars. Okay, so this is the, the, the I, I, let's say, a presentation of the phonotactics of Middle Chinese type a syllables ending in velar nasal, which is to say on the, on the left, you have a list of middle Chinese rhymes. And then in the second column, you have the name in, in terms of the you know, Chinese uh, philological tradition of those rhymes. And then across the top, you have the uh, position of articulation, or, or yeah, that's the, the the position of articulation, which is to say, you know, capital P. This is a normal convention that you're all familiar with, right? Uh, capital P means pa, pa, and ba, and ma. Yeah. Uh, so then we see which types of syllables occur and which types of syllables don't occur. And let's say the first point to make is just that it's ugly, right? Like this is a very asymmetrical distribution of co-occurrences co between rhymes and uh, initials. So, you know, the point of internal reconstruction is, uh, which is basically, let's say, methodologically the same as phonemic analysis in a way, right, is how can we look at this mess and make it more beautiful? So the first uh, thing we do is we propose uh, that, oh, I mean, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through the evidence of it. You see that there, that the, that those rhymes that have a medial W uh, only occur with the velar initials. So then it's tempting to say, 
uh, that in those cases, the medial W is actually a feature of the initial rather than a feature of the rhyme. So that's this proposal, which is basically that we can reconstruct a class of labiovelar initials. Okay, well then let's do that. And this is what we get, right? So we've just, we've added a, a row, sorry, no, we've added a column at the far right. Now we have labiovelar initials, and then we've rearranged the distribution of the cells, and it's much more elegant. I mean, I, I think you will agree, right? So we, go, we went from this with lots of blanks in lots of places uh, to this where there are fewer blanks. Yeah, so I think we've made some progress already. Okay, so now the next uh, hypothesis, which again, you can just understand as motivated entirely based on internal reconstruction, is that we have these, these two Middle Chinese vowels. Uh, so the first one is, is, is a, you know, with A, E written together. And the second one in IPA is, is epsilon, so A, I think. So we propose that uh, uh, the first one came from rang with a medial R in, in, China, in Old Chinese, and the second one came from reng, uh, so with, with medial R and an E vowel. Uh, and then we uh, can now remove from our phonotactic distribution uh, the rhymes ang and uh, ang. Yeah. So now I've done that. I've removed those. And this is the, the pattern uh, that we get. And, um, and now we've already reached a five vowel hypothesis for uh, old Chinese based on the internal reconstruction of type A syllables with a velar nasal final. Uh, and the only remaining gaps now seem quite well motivated uh, phonetically, right? The uh, labio velar initial does not co-occur with the rounded vowels. That that's a you know that doesn't bother me. That seems like a very normal thing to happen across the world. So you know we're done in a sense. Like oh great, we've made a nice elegant internal reconstruction of the old Chinese vowels. But does it work uh, for the dental finals? So uh, we will now take a look at that and just to sort of preview uh, that. Uh, we will again make use of the labiovelar hypothesis, but we're going to add another hypothesis, which is the rounded vowel hypothesis. And I'm going to just to sort of simplify the presentation, I'm going to assume the R hypothesis, which means I can exclude all rhymes with uh, the vowels A and E because they're secondary. Yeah, so then if we start off uh, you know, which is to say, so far I've only assumed the R hypothesis. This is the distribution we get. And once again, you notice that uh, it's a little bit uh, different than last time. You notice that medial W occurs um, more favorably with v uh, velar initials, but not only with velar initials. So, uh, oh, yeah, also just, you know, it's, it's worth the effort. This is not a very elegant distribution. So we, um, so we look, so we try first to get rid of this quen, and you guessed it, we're going to use the labiovelar hypothesis, and there we go. We got rid of the quen by adding this, uh, this uh, column of labiovelars, and, uh, and, I'm, you're, you're now seeing how I will be presenting the, the rest of the argument uh, today, uh, which is basically I, I, I leave the Middle Chinese, I make a proposal for, for Old Chinese, I present it as reconstructed, and then we kind of watch how that uh, cell develops through time. So uh, let's look first at uh, Quan. So, 
Juan goes from having the labial as a part of the initial to a medial, and then we that's how we get from Old Chinese to Middle Chinese. Quite straightforward. We leave that one behind. We go to the next one, uh, which you know, it, let's. I'm not proposing that, that Old Chinese actually had this syllable. It's just a sort of analytical device, right? It's it's the uh, initial labial velar plus the um, plus the rhyme in the row. Well, uh, you know, it, it, just now changing the labial velar initial into a uh, a velar followed by a labial medial, we get Kuan with two Ws in a row, which of course doesn't make any sense. So we uh, reduce that to um, uh, to just one. And uh, there we go. And, and now you see that these three cells all would have ended up with the same thing in Middle Chinese, right? So uh, Kuan in Middle Chinese will sort of occupy three cells of our presumed old Chinese uh, reconstruction. So next we look at uh, this Quen uh, and you kind of get the idea. That's how we get Quen. Uh, and then now we look at uh, Qua before the un, un the, the the sorry the schwa pretty you know you, you understand so I don't need to talk through all of it and now that's we're back to middle Chinese okay so now we look around and see let's try to fill some of these other holes now that we've dealt with Quen. Uh, so, yeah, so now we're moving on to the rounded vowel hypothesis, which is we still have um, some, some medial Ws, right? And we kind of want to get rid of them. Well, why do we want to get rid of them? You can say, well, we managed to get rid of them with the, uh, the velar finals. So, so it would be quite inelegant if you had an, a version of Old Chinese that had no medial W before velar finals, uh, but there is a medial W before uh, nasal finals. So, I'm uh, sorry, before dental finals. So that's our, our goal, is to get rid of these syllables, yeah? So we propose the rounded vowel hypothesis. And the rounded vowel hypothesis is that rounded vowels break uh, before dentals. So we get on goes to one and un goes to one. Now let's see what happens if we apply the rounded vowel hypothesis. So uh, you see already that, that now we're kind of getting close to that five vowel analysis that we managed to achieve for the velars. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, so now we'll talk through those developments from Old Chinese to Middle Chinese, like we did uh, already. So first looking at ton, ton changes into tuan. Then we look at tsuan, tsuan changes into tsuan. Then we look at kon, kon changes into kuan. And now we look at kuon, which you know may well not have existed. Uh, but in any case, you get, again, uh, Quan. Okay. Now, Pun, Pun, Tun, Tuan, Sun, Sun, Kun, Quan. And Kuan, which probably didn't exist, uh, goes also to Quan. Yeah. So we've made some good progress. And now we just have, or now, now we still want to fill these gaps that are remaining. So we say, uh, let's fill the gaps for Quan and Pun. So Middle Chinese does not have a phonemic distinction between uh, Pu and Pu. Uh, and this, I think it's a, 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 a Yuan Ren Zhao who figured this out in the 1940s. So that's nice for us at the moment, uh, and we can understand it uh, sort of historically speaking as a merger. So 
There used to be a pa and a poa that were distinguished. And now you just get, you know, you can think of it as either a pa or a poa, but we just get one thing that doesn't distinguish the two. So that's a, a merger. Now, uh, th this is a, maybe a sort of subtle point, but um, the, the rhyme books, no, sorry, it's actually the rhyme tables will sort of annotate some labial initial syllables as hooko and some as kaiko, which is to say some with a medial W and some without a medial W. There is no phonemic contrast, but in respect to the philological evidence in Baxter's representation of Middle Chinese, you still get sometimes you know a P and sometimes a PW uh, kind of in accordance to how the rhyme tables present it, but there's no distinction. So uh, I just want to, to emphasize that. And now we can fill in some of these uh, holes by, uh, look. so we look at this uh, and, uh, uh, and we look at this one and you see that, uh, yeah, was that clear? Yeah, you go from, so, so you go from pon to puan and then puan becomes uh, pan because there's no distinction between pan and puan in Middle Chinese. And now we've managed uh, to fill that hole. Now we turn to uh, pun, and it's very similar. Pun goes to puan, and then puan uh, we have. Uh, and then uh, the same thing will happen with puan. No, puan, I think we already had. So in any case, this is how we fill these cells and then and then you see that there are a lot of kind of mergers that go on the way from old Chinese to middle Chinese and now the only inelegance is uh, is is Tun and Sun are missing and uh, th these ones are sort of harder to um, motivate and uh, what would be nice is to find uh, a place in the shridging where, where those syllables rhyme with uh, kun, because then, you know, or be, where any syllable that starts with a ta or a tsa rhymes with kun, because then you would be able to figure out, oh, okay, it probably has the same rhyme as kun, uh, and then I can see how it develops in the middle Chinese, but it, there just happen to not be such cases. So we're going to just leave it there and live with the pain of having those two cells missing for a good while. Now we're sort of done with type A syllables and we'll move on to type B syllables. Like, I think, you know, it kind of, you can do that if you want. Um, the question is, how does that interact in, in your system with the labiovelar uh, hypothesis? Uh, that's fine, but then how do you explain, I mean, it's, it, what it fundamentally comes down to is that there are there, let's let's kind of put it this way. Uh, there's an inelegance in Middle Chinese, which is that some uh, some uh, hooko rhymes are compatible with all initials, and some hooko rhymes are only compatible with velar initials. So I think that the combination of uh, the labiovelar hypothesis and the uh, rounded vowel hypothesis uh, is very nice in terms of getting rid of uh, that inelegance. Um, now, uh, there's another consideration too, which we sort of haven't gotten to, which is, you know, from the perspective of uh, just the internal reconstruction of Middle Chinese, Kind of who cares? We can have the rounded vowel hypothesis uh, and reconstruct rounded vowels, or we can uh, do what you're proposing and and do the opposite and say those rounded vowels that we do have are kind of um, I don't know, kind of uh, 
merge is not quite the right uh, word, but are coalescences of, uh, of medial W with a non-rounded vowel. That's fine from the perspective of Middle Chinese internal reconstruction. However, they yield different predictions in terms of the behavior of rhyme in Old Chinese, where the rounded vowel hypothesis would suggest that, uh, that Middle Chinese, uh, let's say, tuan would never rhyme in Old Chinese with Middle Chinese tan. Whereas your hypothesis would predict that Middle Chinese that that Middle Chinese tuan and Middle Chinese tan would interrhyme in Old Chinese. I see. Now, the question is: if you just test those two hypotheses against Old Chinese uh, data, what's the result? And the answer is, it's controversial. Uh, you can think of the whole of Baxter's 1992 book as an attempt to do that. Uh, and then what, what he's saying is that uh, his claim is uh, tuan and tan do not rhyme in old Chinese. So that's very strong evidence that the labia, that the, that the, the rounded vowel hypothesis is correct. And let's say, if I try to take the perspective of a third party and say there are two camps, there's basically the, the six vowel camp and the old Chinese had a medial W camp. The question is, has the old Chinese has a medial W camp answered the arguments of Baxter 1992? And my impression is the the answer to that question is no. That there there like if you read Polly Blank's review, uh, or if you read Hudaan's review of the 2014 book, like there there's a lot of venom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> against the six vowel hypothesis. But I don't see an attempt to offer a superior analysis of the data of old Chinese rhymes that answers the, uh, the, the arguments in Baxter 1992. And I mean, that might, let's say, to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, that might be, be simply for exogenous reasons, like that Baxter's uh, argument is extremely sophisticated and involves the use of statistics and whatnot, and that you know these sort of uh, elderly gentlemen philologists in Taiwan are just not you know, they just don't have the tools at, at hand to offer the kind of critique that can be made. Yeah, I'm perfectly willing to believe that. And then the, the issue is just, well, then someone needs to do it, right? Someone needs to, 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 to uh, let's say, rise to the occasion of demonstrating that uh, the belief that Old Chinese has a medial W better explains the rhyme patterns of the Shijing than Baxter's uh, system does. And, you know, as far as I can tell, that hasn't been done. It's a hard project because, you know, it's, it's sort of responding to a sort of 1200 page book, right? But, but I haven't seen it done. And, and maybe I haven't seen it done just because I don't, you know, know the Chinese language literature well enough. But um, that's my uh, sense. I would just sort of remind you about the the sort of what we covered yesterday in terms of methodology, right? Which is kind of the the way we try to get at uh, old Chinese is by reconciling three things. Uh, one is an internal reconstruction of Middle Chinese. One is rhyme patterns in the Churching, and one is uh, the Shesheng series. Yeah. So to kind of uh, you know, a sort of attempt to restate your question. Um, the um, it, it, it comes down to how well you think this internal reconstruction does against those other two sets of data, right? So, like, um, you know, like, let's let's put it this way: the null hypothesis, in a way, is old Chinese was exactly the same as Middle Chinese. But 
we can show that 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 only gets us so far in making the rhyme patterns of the Shijing and the Sheisheng series uh, work. I mean, it does get you a certain distance, yeah. And and I think the fact that it gets you a certain distance shows that Middle Chinese and Old Chinese are not unrelated languages, yeah. Um, but you sort of when you look at the rhyme patterns of the Shijing just in Middle Chinese, or you look at the readings of the Sheisheng series just in Middle Chinese, you sort of say, mm, there's something going on here, but it's not quite right. So n now we're proposing, based purely on questions of elegance, internal reconstruction of Middle Chinese, and then we can see, does that, you know, let's say ideologically driven internal reconstruction of Middle Chinese actually help us do something like explain the rhymes of the Shijing or make the Sheisheng series more regular. Let's say there, there's the, the mode of investigation and the mode of presentation, right? And of, of course, the this way of internally reconstructing Middle Chinese was not invented in isolation from uh, those two bodies of data. That was a kind of historical dialectic process. But I'm trying to find a mode of presentation that's elegant. And I may have failed in doing that, right? Uh, um, so, so, so in doing that, I've tried to sort of isolate the act of internal reconstruction and then be able to present it as Here's a hypothesis motivated purely on Middle Chinese grounds. Oh, look, it works against the data. Uh, I, the reason why I think I think that is more elegant than doing it the other way around is because otherwise it would just be very anecdotal. It's like, oh, look at this rhyme. It doesn't seem very nice. Let's try to fix it. A and that would be just be sort of uh, like sort of wandering through the fields and randomly picking flowers, yeah? Whereas if you start from the distributional patterns of Middle Chinese, it, it is motivated, the hypothesis to me seem more vote motivated in terms of, uh, you know, considerations of elegance. Okay. So now we have a theory of old Chinese vowels and uh, what, yeah, based on type A syllables, and we want to move to type B syllables. So what I do in my book is try to kind of repeat the sort of reasoning that uh, we have just done for the type A syllables with the type B syllables. But I, in preparing these lectures, I decided that that actually was not, that, 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 that was, that the type B syllables are sufficiently complicated that that ends up being quite ugly. Uh, so instead, what I'm going to do here is more or less assume that our analysis of uh, the type A syllables is correct, and then try to fill in this grid in the type B syllables, which is to say, we, we assume that Old Chinese had these five uh, vowels, so these five uh, rhymes before N, we assume it had this class of initials, and then we can try to fill in each cell with the outcome in Middle Chinese, type B syllables, of that Old Chinese syllable. So that's the goal I'm going to set, and we will try and do it mostly by looking at rhymes and Sheisheng series. So let's uh, see what happens. This is the way you can think of it. I have the grid. It's all full of question marks. And uh, I'm going to try and fill it in. And uh, you'll notice that the, the, the way where I'm writing the classes of initials have changed, where you have all these J's and Y's. That's because that's how type B is indicated in Baxter's um, uh, transcription of Middle Chinese. So. We look at Middle Chinese type A readings of unambiguous origin. We identify the type B Sheisheng connections of that reading. We look at rhyme behavior of words with that reading, and we try to uh, 
fill the slot. Okay, so first we're going to look at Tan. Um, and, and just to sort of talk you through it, why am I not looking at Pan? Because it's not unambiguous in terms of origin. And why am I not looking at Quan? It's because it's not unambiguous in terms of origin. So I'm starting by looking at Tan in type A syllables and seeing kind of what type B syllables it has connections to. So here we look at a Sheisheng series where we have Tan in type A syllable, and it has type B connections like Zien and Trien uh, and Xian. Okay. So this suggests that uh, Old Chinese An changed to N in type B syllables, at least after acute initials, which is to say after T and you know Tra. So that's one now sound change we can propose. And this is something that Baxter calls acute fronting. Okay, now let's look at the rhyme behavior. So Tan can rhyme with Pyeong, uh, Dan rhymes with Ngun, Dan rhymes with uh, Drien. So we have further evidence for acute fronting. And we also have evidence for uh, sort of yan turning into yun. And this change Baxter calls a raising. Okay. And we also have evidence that acute fronting preceded a raising, which is why we get uh, the schwa only in circumstances, only with those initials that are non-acute, or putting it another way, only with grave initials. So you see in, in Ode 76.3, we have uh, the schwa after a, a velar initial, uh, but in Ode uh, 112.1, we have the a vowel after a, uh, a retroflex initial. So, um, so that's my argument that uh, acute fronting preceded a raising. Okay, so uh, this allows us to fill in the first row. Yeah. If if this isn't making sense, then someone you know stop me. Uh, so now we look at the second row and we find an unambiguous type A syllable, unambiguous in terms of its origin in the second row. So I'm gonna look at Tuan. And we then look at what are the type B connections in Sheisheng series and in rhymes of this type A syllable Tuan. So we look at the Sheisheng evidence and we see that, uh, for instance, Duan uh, is uh, connected with Xuan or no, we'll say Chuen. Yeah, Chuen and Chuen. Okay. So, uh, this suggests that vowel breaking preceded acute fronting. So what, what, why am I saying this? Because imagine that, uh, that this Duan was uh, actually Dawn. So then the first syllable, let's say uh, here, uh, 0231A would have been sort of type B Tson, and the second syllable, 231C, would have been type A, Don. Well, uh, then you, you change them both to things like Duan and uh, Chuan, and, and then you get acute fronting to change Chuan into Chuan. Yeah, so uh, vowel breaking has to precede acute fronting. Okay. Now we look at rhyme evidence. And we see that uh, Duan rhymes with things like Nguyen, and Luan rhymes with things like Xuan. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, and then I will just leave uh, to the reader or to the listener uh, that that, that um, pawn in type B uh, will turn out as uh, Xuan. Okay, 
So now we've filled in the second row. Now we turn to uh, the third row. No, actually, we skip the third row. Yeah, because the third row uh, ends up being uh, tricky, I think. Yeah. So let's go to the fourth row, uh, sh schwa, uh, n, and we look for an unambiguous syllable in terms of its origins in type A syllables. So we look at kun, and we look at the Sheshung connections of kun. Uh, and uh, the, the one that's relevant for us is the last one uh, with this barred I. And this gives us the pretty trivial result that, uh, you know, in, in type B syllables, uh, something like gun turns into, I mean, I'm not even going to try and distinguish a schwa and a barred I. Uh, so, but in any case, uh, that's one result. Uh, now we look at uh, rhyming evidence. And we see that, uh, uh, okay, the, the first one just confirms again that type A schwa has connections with type B barred I. Um, <clears throat> but then the, the second and third examples are more interesting because uh, here we have, uh, we, we look at this uh, barred I that we know has uh, a connection to the type A syllable that we started from, and we see that it has um, uh, two further connections with un and with in. So uh, here are our conclusions. So uh, we have something actually like uh, the merger of uh, a, a W initial before schwa uh, in, into a, the rounded vowel u, un. Yeah, and I do not actually find anywhere that Baxter discusses this change. Uh, maybe he, he saw it as kind of too picayune to worry about, uh, but it, it, it seems like it's necessary to make the whole system work. Uh, okay, so, uh, and oh yeah, so that's the, the first thing we noticed from this rhyme evidence was this sort of change that Baxter doesn't mention. And then the second thing, is something we can call schwa fronting, which is that uh, basically between two acutes, um, schwa fronts to i. And Baxter called this barred i fronting, uh, but uh, that's because in 1992 he used this barred i uh, everywhere, where um, in 2014 Baxter and Cigar use a, a schwa. Uh, in some of these cases, so I think we should call it schwa fronting. Okay. Two remarks. Uh, the only evidence I have for the analogous change uh, with, uh, with retroflex initials is from this series. And um, Yes, and uh, if if you um, so we saw this um, uh, this sort of pun turns into pun, so then we would expect uh, uh, something like that to happen uh, with a final ya, uh, and it it doesn't. Um, yeah, no such syllable exists. So, I mean, these are my, let's say, just random observations. You can understand it that way. Uh, and uh, as a third remark, it looks like schwa J type A syllables and schwa J type B syllables never rhyme in the Shijing, which just is, yeah, maybe it's a random gap or maybe it's something that should be looked at more. Uh, maybe, you know, somehow they were already pronounced uh, differently enough in the Shijing that they didn't make good rhymes. I don't know. It, uh, no one, I, I, these are observations I don't think I've seen anyone talking about before. But in any case, you know, plowing ahead, <laughs> we have managed to fill in the fourth row of our type B syllables. Um, <clears throat> so 
now let's go to the last row and we look for again a type a syllable with an unambiguous origin and then we look at its Sheshang and rhyme connections so we do that so we are looking at Sheshang connections for Tuan and here they are we have uh, you know the, it's kind of the stuff you would expect actually you know so twin twin uh, and this allows us uh, to propose uh, that um, uh, I think I've maybe done something wrong here. Uh, yeah, it's the, there. One, one of the signs is backwards. Sorry about that. But so we we start from uh, type B tun. It turns into tun. That's vowel breaking. And then we get a twin that's acute fronting, yeah. And then similarly, trun goes to truan goes to truin. So these are sound changes we've already seen before with the O case. Now we're seeing it with the U case. Um, but it also shows that vowel breaking precedes schwa fronting, yeah. So uh, so that's interesting. And we now that was based on a Shesheng series. So now we look at the rhyme evidence and we see that uh, Duan rhymes with Myun and then uh, some other rhyme connections that you can look at uh, that there's no need for me to talk you through. And that allows us to fill in the fifth row like this. Okay, so So far, so good. Now, um, yeah, so now I'm just uh, showing where the mergers are again, yeah. So now we need to address this third row, the, the N case, which I've sort of postponed. So we look for an unambiguous syllable, uh, pen in type A syllables, and we look at uh, the Sheshang evidence. Uh, and um, the, the trouble is, yeah, that we, 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 we don't have as much rhyme data as we want. And I don't feel like I've learned very much from looking at pen. So we're going to look at 10. But the trouble with 10 is that uh, because uh, Tun changes into 10, you know, on its way to Chen, I think, uh, it, 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 10 is actually not unambiguous. Yeah. So, uh, but we look any case, you know, because what choice we have, and we see uh, these things, Chin and Chin. Okay. And uh, and we also take a look at Ken, although it it um, uh, because there's there's no rhyme evidence for pen, so we look at Ken, uh, uh, which is unambiguous in our current theory, uh, and then we see that Ken rhymes with something like Xuan, uh, and Un, which is covered. Let's say this maybe wasn't clear, but glottal stop initials are covered by my capital K in terms of um, you know, cases. We get uh, a connection with Schwen. So we've more or less been able to fill in uh, this third uh, row, although you can see why I postponed it because it's, it's like there's the, the evidence starts to be gappy in such a way that I have to kind of reach in different places for different things. Uh, but this is what uh, you end up with. Uh, and this is our sort of five vowel hypothesis for type B syllables. Okay, so we have one last hole we need to, to plug. And uh, it's, there's a reason why, you know, it's, it's sort of stuck out uh, because it's this change, uh, Ken changes to Chin. And here's some Sheshang evidence for it, which is you have this uh, Jin uh, in 377A in the same series as Ken, 
which is uh, 0368C. And this change is, the, is, is called the first palatalization, which is the palatalization of velars uh, before front vowels. It happened quite early, whereas the general palatalization that you see across all type B syllables is the second palatalization. Okay, so there we've done it. We've filled the last hole. It's a little bit counterintuitive because it's an interesting change, uh, but there it is. So, and then you see that that's also a, a, an interesting kind of merger. So there we did it. Great, hooray. And we've ended up with a five vowel theory of, uh, of old Chinese because you saw you know, we started from the type A syllables before velars. We moved to the type A syllables before dentals. Uh, uh, we came up with this five vowel theory. We assumed it worked for type B syllables, looked at Sheshung evidence and rhyme evidence and managed to plug in all the holes. So, uh, so far so good. And it turns out there's not a six vowel theory. There's a five vowel theory. Well, not quite because there are three middle Chinese type B syllables that we have not yet explained. So we, you know, so, so we started with this uh, grid with, of question marks, filled it all in, and we still have stuff left over. So we, we, so we haven't come up with the right analysis. So we might as well presume a sixth vowel that gave rise to some cases of trin and chin, and then it will give us a place to put our pin, kin, and quin. So that, so that's you know, my sixth vowel, uh, and then I put the sixth vowel into the the chart, and this is what I get. Yeah. And then you see there's been a lot of mergers, which is why the um, the type B syllables are a little bit messy. Okay, so great. Now we've got the six vowel theory. Uh, but then you say, well, Nathan, uh, not quite. You've got a five vowel theory for type A syllables and a six vowel theory for type B syllables. So then we need to act, kind of return to the type A syllables and say, well, what happened to the sixth vowel in the type A syllables? So let's look at that. So we're going to uh, look at type B pin and look at Sheshang evidence and uh, rhyme evidence. So, so we're kind of now, you see it's a kind of movement back and forth. We, we've developed a, a five vowel theory in type A syllables. We saw that it basically worked for type B syllables, but then we needed a sixth vowel. So now we're going to see in the same way that we, we did uh, on the type B syllables, back on the type A syllables, what could fill those slots in the type A situation? Okay, so we look uh, at uh, what are pins, uh, connections, and we see there's a connection with Ben, type A. Uh, and then in terms of rhyme evidence, we see that pin rhymes with nen, and mien rhymes with when, and mien rhymes with den and ten. Uh, okay. And now we move on to the next you know, uh, column in the chart and say, what are the type A connections to type B syllables like quin? Uh, so we see that, uh, well, we have a Sheshun connection with uh, a syllable when, uh, and we have a rhyme connection with a syllable hen. So this allows us to basically plug these holes in the following way. Which is that? Uh, um, which is as you see. So we put pen, ten, ken, and quen into the um, the in row. And I have not been able to find any direct evidence that allows for it. But it's pretty clear that if you wanted to just speculate what would go into the sin slot, it would be ten. So let's just, whoop, well, we don't have any counter evidence, so, but uh, you know, it's a little bit ex cathedra, but there you go. So this is our six vowel theory in type A syllables so far. 
and you see that there's been a merger, a systematic merger of the in vowel and the n vowel uh, in type A syllables. And this is a change that Baxter calls mid to high. So type A in changes to n. Now there's still two holes left, uh, which we've been leaving aside for a long time. You see them with the question marks here. So let's plug the two last holes. I see no compelling direct evidence that tells us how type A, Tun, and Sun develop. But at this point, we have a lot of theory internal uh, machinery that we can bring to bear. So, uh, so let's do it. Uh, schwa fronting occurred, if we suspect, if we, if we propose that schwa fronting occurred uh, in type A uh, syllables, as well as in type A B syllables, we get that, uh, that ton turned into tin. Uh, and then we already had to propose the high mid change. So then we would get tin changes into 10. So these sum to ton changes into 10. And then that allows us to fill in these last two spots. Oh yeah, okay. So yeah, so here's plugging the last uh, two holes. I don't see that there's any direct evidence, mm -hmm. uh, but here's the internal machinery. We've already proposed schwa fronting. And we've already proposed high to mid. Yeah. So high, so schwa fronting plus high to mid gives us uh, this change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that tells us uh, how to plug the hole. Okay. I just feel like I need to, you know, take a deep breath and say. That's it. <laughs> we have we have we have done it. We've gotten the six vowel theory in both type A and type B syllables. And you say, uh, yeah, this is now. Uh, uh, you say I'm not super convinced. It seemed a little bit like you know you teleological. You 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 sort of railroaded us through, uh, and then especially right there at the end for plugging a, a, a few holes, had no direct evidence to point to. Well, my Achilles heel in this presentation uh, is the distinction between tin, ton, and ten. In, in, is, so hopefully that will be clear to people. And that distinction was already proposed by Duan Yutsai. Which is to which is to say, you know, I, I'm I'm trying to sort of step back and say like, is the six vowel theory right or wrong? Well, um, the weakest point in my presentation of the six vowel theory today is something that has been seen as solved, done, and dusted for you know since the night the the very early 19th century. Um, so the the so so now I'm just going a little bit into that history. Uh, um, the 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 yeah this pioneer in uh, the analysis of uh, old Chinese rhymes, uh, uh, he treated what are called in the philological tradition uh, the 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 Jun rhyme the Zhuang the sorry the Jun rhyme the Yuan rhyme and the Wen rhyme as one category. And then uh, this uh, guy who I think we've met before, uh, Zhang Yong, came al along and he divided out the Yuan rhyme. And then Duan Yutsai distinguished all three. So in Duan Yutsai's numbering or in the traditional numbering uh, that is still, uh, let's say, used in the kind of Wang Li school, there are 30 uh, rhyme classes for Old Chinese. And here you see the 20th, the 23rd, and the 26th, the Jun, the one, and the Yuan. And um, in Baxter and Cigar systems, those categories cover all of the reconstructed finals you see, which is to say Baxter and Cigar draw a lot more distinctions than, uh, than the Wang Li school does or than Duan Yutsai did. But 
the, the key, you know, place where I sort of pulled a rabbit out of a hat has been considered settled since Duan Yutsai's time. There is a question of like, well, why did, you know, you know, what, what, why is it that, that, that this distinction between these three is so non-obvious for me in this presentation, but was so obvious for the Chinese uh, uh, philological tradition? And I think that's a darn good question. And I started to look into it a little bit, but found it a little, um, you know, like, like trying to get inside uh, the head of a, uh, uh, an 18th century Chinese philologist uh, who was analyzing uh, the patterns that he saw in the poetry that he was looking at uh, turned out to be more than I could do in preparation for this lecture. So, um, so I'll just leave it there and say, it might seem like uh, this is all some kind of grand artifice but its weakest moment is a, a moment that there is total unanimity uh, on in the discipline. Uh, and there has been for, you know, uh, like 200 years. Yeah, I could do that. I mean, let's say next time, next year, I'll do that as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point, which is like, I've shown that the 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 six vowel theory works for final uh, velars and final dentals, but I haven't shown that it works for final labials. I think it ends up not being interesting, um, but uh, but sort of um, in Baxter and Cigar's presentation, to 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 my mind, they they may not think this is fair. They do a really good job with the 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 velar finals. And then they jump immediately to the to the Qing phonologists, and they basically like for exactly the same thing that I needed them for, but they jump to it much earlier. And they say basically, if if you combine um, the the Wang Li system, uh, the traditional view, with uh, you know these observations, then you immediately get the six vowel theory. And to me, it felt just a little bit too magical, you know, like, woo, look, <laughs> six vowel theory. Um, and, um, and relied too much on the Qing phonologist. So I was trying to kind of a little bit more dig around in the weeds of, of the Shesheng series and the rhymes to kind of build up a plausibility for the six vowel theory uh, based on the primary sources. And then it turns out that I still have to kind of uh, pull the same rabbit out of the same hat in terms of turning to to Duan Yutsai at the end, uh, which 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 made me very angry when I realized uh, that, that you know my presentation still had that weakness, uh, but I still think it was kind of worth it in a way that that my that that I don't know that I mean you can read their presentation and I also feel this way about the presentation in my book, which it just ends up being a little bit too fast, a little bit too kind of. Poof, it, see, it works, yeah. Um, um, uh, whereas uh, when I thought about actually uh, this presentation, I thought, uh, well, maybe I should also do the labial finals, but I think there will be some people in the audience right now who, who feel like, no, 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 that was quite enough. We don't need the, <laughs> the, the labial finals as well. I mean, let's, let's put it this way. There, there is no, uh, I mean, I haven't actually gone through and and done it all, but uh, the labial finals are simpler than the dental finals. So uh, so based on I, I took a little bit of a look at it, and it's sort of this is where it's, I'm really relying on my memory of very subjective perceptions. But my sense is the velar finals are 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 dead easy. They're 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 the circumstance that motivates the whole theory, right? The labial finals are sort of intermediate which is that they're not that complicated, but there's some things, there's some labial neutralization that happened very early uh, that kind of confuses the picture a little bit. Uh, and then the, the dental finals are very complicated. So basically what I did was I tried to motivate the theory by the simple case and then, and then show that the theory does work in the most complicated case. Uh, and then hope that sort of those two together means this, the system works. 
Um, but I, I agree with you that sort of a, a, a good thorough presentation would go through all of the cases. Um, I mean, one thing that, that, that I think people will have suffered through in this presentation is that it, it's, it's a very sort of interlocking system where you kind of need everything all at once. Um, and, and as a consequence, if you really, you know, systematically presented, we're going to do the six vowel theory in all kind of phonotactic circumstances, you would end up having to look at every sound change in, in, in the history of from old Chinese to middle Chinese, but actually that's probably a good way of presenting it. Yeah. Uh, is, is, you know, all of Chinese historical phonology as a motivation for the six vowel theory. That's actually would make a nice little, you know, book, little book. Yeah. Um, uh, but I haven't done it. <laughs>